Hello, it's Dr. Yami. And today I wanted to make a video and recording about climate change, sustainability, and the coronavirus. Today is April the 1st, and in the United States, April the 1st is a holiday known as April Fool's Day. So it's a day that we usually take a lighthearted approach to life. We might prank each other. There might be silly, funny memes on social media, and we just joke around and have fun. Unfortunately, this year on April the 1st, it's a rather somber time because the entire world has been affected by a pandemic, the coronavirus, the COVID-19. And there's been lots of great experts and other doctors out there that have been covering the facts and keeping everybody informed. So I haven't said very much on social media because I feel like, you know, that's not really my area of expertise. I've been talking to my patients and their families, make sure that they're safe and they're informed, but I really haven't said much in my podcast or in this format. However, I have had planned for the month of April for a long time to talk about climate change and sustainability. So this month, all of my podcast episodes and bonus episodes, as well as social media posts are going to be centered around this theme. And this is something that I had planned before this pandemic began. However, ironically, the coronavirus and the origins of the coronavirus align perfectly with some of the themes I'm going to be talking about. And so that's why today I wanted to do a bonus episode on the coronavirus. So um, first of all, I wanna begin by saying that I started doing research on this and I realized that it is much more complex than it seems, just like anything. And second of all, I am not an expert on this topic. So I may get some things wrong and I'm just doing the best I can to understand myself, what I can do and how I can help with these kinds of things. Um, and also to share my knowledge with you. But again, just like anything else, once you start looking into it, there's so many more layers and so much more complexity. So I'm just going to be skimming the surface. And second of all, I do not claim to be an expert, okay? Pediatrician, lifestyle medicine doctor, definitely not an expert on zoonotic diseases or pandemics. So the more reading I did, the more research I did into this topic though, the more I realized how it is related to the topic of sustainability and climate change. So you may have heard that the coronavirus originated in a wet market in Wuhan, China. Now this is a theory, we don't know this for sure, but this is one of the theories. Now I wanna distinguish because we're hearing the term wet market a lot. A wet market is kind of like a farmer's market. So it's a place where they have fruits and vegetables and produce, but they also have meat. And the reason it's called a wet market is because you know, as they're washing the fruits and vegetables or cleaning out the meat stalls, the floors of the market become wet. Now, usually in wet markets, they don't have live animals. Those are called wildlife markets, but sometimes the wet markets and the wildlife markets do become intermingled, and that's when there can be some cross-contamination and problems that can happen. So wildlife markets are places that sell live and sometimes dead animals, usually exotic wild animals for the purposes of human consumption. So in China, 54 species can be traded live for human consumption. And you can look up pictures of these places. They have all kinds of animals, including koalas, snakes, minks, snapping turtles, crocodiles, dogs, different kinds of cats, rats, birds, and along with other maybe more common animals that we associate with eating, such as chickens, pigs, and other farm animals like that. Now, I don't have a very good cultural understanding of, you know, Chinese practices, but from the reading I have done, the consumption of these wild animals, sometimes endangered animals, is not common even though what we see in the media, it seems like maybe it's common, 
it's actually restricted to a small percentage of the population and maybe even more concentrated in the older generations. And the other thing is just being culturally sensitive because some of the things I'm gonna talk about have to do with um, cultures that have been passed down for hundreds of years and this is just somebody's way of life. So not, um, we, we have to be sensitive about those things as well and not demonize a practice or a way of life. But this is just helping us understand. I just wanna give more understanding about those things. So it is theorized that the COVID-19 actually originated from bats, but the bats aren't the ones that transferred it to the humans. It went from bats to an animal called a pangolin, and then from pangolins to humans. Now, pangolins are endangered. They're also known as, uh, I think it's called um, some sort of an anteater. Look at, I have all these notes here. But anyway, they're endangered. They are super cute and adorable. And it's actually illegal to eat them. However, there may be some loopholes there where they can be used because their scales, oh, that's what they're called. They're called the scaly anteater. Um, they're super adorable. So whenever they, um, they get threatened, they actually roll themselves into a little ball and they're super cute. But their scales have been used in, Chinese medicine. Um, so this is like an ancient practice. So because of that loophole, maybe that's a way that people can access them. But either way, it is an exotic meat that some people may consume. Um, it may be seen kind of as like lucrative and a luxurious thing to do. So people may offer that um, to their clients as a way of showing, um, you know, their status, things like that. So I don't understand this very much, but this is the theory of how it might have gotten passed on to humans is the handling and consumption of this animal known as a pangolin. So that is where we think that the coronavirus might have originated. Like I said, we're not 100% sure. It's a theory. But I do want to talk to you about the different ways that we can acquire infections from animals. So there are three main ways, and these can be both direct and indirect ways that we can get infections from humans. So the first one is vector diseases. The second one is zoonotic diseases. And the third one is the actual um, contamination of meat and water sources, food and water sources. Okay, so vector diseases account for 17% of all infectious diseases, causing more than 700,000 deaths annually. In fact, do you know what the world's deadliest creature is? Is it a shark? Is it a lion? Some might even say human but actually the world's deadliest creature is actually a mosquito. So mosquitoes are vectors, and vectors are living organisms that transmit infections between humans, between animals and humans, or humans to humans. And they can transmit infections through bacteria, viruses, or parasites. And some common vectors, like I said, are mosquitoes, but also include fleas. That's a big one I'm gonna talk about later, flies, lice, and ticks. So some of the infections that you may have heard that are vector-borne infections, one of the most deadly, malaria, dengue, Chagas disease, leishmaniasis, the plague, Lyme disease, which we hear about a lot these days, tick-borne encephalitis, and West Nile virus. So because these diseases are transmitted via a vector, you actually don't have to come into direct contact with the animal, but you're usually near that animal or another human that has the disease. And so this can happen, especially for things like ticks. You may be hiking in nature, but also if you are in there hunting deer, you're gonna be coming in contact with the kind of tick that may cause um, Lyme disease. So the best way to prevent these vector-borne diseases is to be aware of the areas where these infections are endemic, where the actual vector is common, 
and to protect yourself from that vector. So we know that if we travel to other countries where malaria is common, we can take prophylaxis, we can take bug spray. If we know we're gonna be hiking in an area that has ticks, we know to check ourselves afterwards. So we can do those kinds of things. But one of the things you may not have thought about or you may not know about is that climate change and overcrowding and displacing animals from their natural habitat may increase vector diseases. So even though you know, we're not coming in direct contact with the animals that may uh, cause these infections, whenever we start changing habitats in the world around us or when climate changes, so say it becomes more humid or more rainy, more mosquitoes may be able to grow from that. So one of those things to think about and I'll address again later. Okay, so zoonotic diseases is where the coronavirus came from. So zoonotic diseases are infections caused by contact with animals, and they're caused by viruses, which is, you know, the coronavirus, bacteria, parasites, and fungi. Zoonotic diseases are incredibly common. So they account for 60% of known infections and three out of four new or emerging infectious diseases. So guess what? That's what COVID-19 was. It is a new disease. And they can be acquired through direct or indirect contact. Like I said, direct contact means you come in direct contact with the animal, their bodily secretions. You may be bitten or scratched by an animal. Indirect contact means you came into contact with surfaces where the animal has roamed and might get in contact with their secretions that way, such as chicken coops, barns, or like I'll talk about later, plants and soil. So there are five stages through which pathogens of animals evolve to cause disease in humans. And I wanted to talk about this just because it's super interesting. I got this little chart from a book called Origins of Major Human Infectious Diseases. This is a little figure here. And if you're listening to this, you're not going to be able to see it, but I'll describe it. And it talks about the five different stages from how diseases can progress from an animal to human. So the first one is stage one. So that means that only animals can transmit it between each other. They can only get it. We can't get it. So that doesn't concern us, right? Because the animal has it. We can't get it. Stage two means that we can get it from an animal, but we can't pass it between humans. An example of a stage two um, pathogen would be rabies. So we can come into contact with an infected animal, we can get rabies, but if I have rabies, I can't pass that to somebody else. Unfortunately, rabies is very deadly, and for those that are going into areas that there might be more rabies, thank goodness there's a vaccine for that. So that was stage two. Stage three, you initially get it from an animal, but then humans can transmit it between humans, but usually it's for a limited time, a limited cycle. It's not like this long lasting thing. So examples of stage three outbreaks would be Ebola, which also unfortunately is a very high mortality infection, and monkeypox. So even though we get it initially from an animal, we pass it between each other, it doesn't just go for cycles and cycles and cycles, it kind of dies out and limits until we get reinfected again. Stage four is a long outbreak. So this is where the COVID-19 would be under, this is where the pandemics um, fall under. A stage four pathogen from an animal to a human. So you initially get it from an animal, then it gets transmitted from human to human, and it is many, many cycles. So other examples of this would be pandemic flu, the plague, and dengue. And then stage five is initially you might get it from an animal, but then it stays within humans and it becomes a human to human infection. An example of that would be HIV, which HIV, it is thought, initially came from chimps eating chimp meat and something called simian immunodeficiency virus and it may have mutated and it became HIV and that's when it be, became able to be transmitted 
between humans by blood infection. So the COVID-19 is a stage four pathogen, so leading to a longer outbreak. Other examples, like I said, are pandemic influenza, which uh, you may have heard things like the avian flu or the bird flu, which we know we can get that from birds and including the factory farmed chickens and poultry that we raise from food. It's very deadly in birds. It may kill like entire flocks of birds, but then it can be passed on to humans and we get sick from it and then we pass it between each other. Another very important historical pandemic is the plague. Now the plague is actually a vector-borne disease. It starts in rats and then fleas from the rats bite humans and it is actually a bacterial infection. The plague actually can still happen, but it's very rare. I've never seen it in my career, thankfully, but it can be treated with antibiotics, thankfully. Back when it killed a lot of people in the 1300s and you know, after that, Unfortunately, there weren't effective treatments. So a lot of people died of the plague and it did get passed between human to human. So there is a, a paper I read called The Origin and Prevention of Pandemics by Brian L. Pike and Karen E. Sailors et al. in Clinical Infectious Diseases from 2010, June 15th of 2010. And I wanted to quote something that they said. Quote, what is known, however, is that the interface between humans and animals is of paramount importance in the process. As we increase our interactions with animals through hunting, the trading of animal foods, animal husbandry practices, wet markets, and the domestication of animals slash exotic pets, the probability of cross-species transmission dramatically increases. So what does that mean? We're gonna come into more contact with animals when we do these things. Animals have diseases. The more we come in contact with them, whether we're using them as exotic pets or we're eating them, we're handling them, we're doing more things with them, we're going to be exposed to these infections and we're going to increase our risk. So it increases our risk to increase our exposure. Now, I want to talk about the third category before I tell you what things maybe we can do now to help decrease our risk and help us get healthier. So the last category is foodborne and waterborne pathogens. Each year, one in six Americans will get sick from eating contaminated food. You may have heard of two very common pathogens that cause infections in food. That's E. coli and salmonella. E. coli 015787 h 7 in particular is a bacteria that can cause very severe and sometimes deadly infections in humans. And it naturally lives in the guts of animals, including cows, including grass-fed cows. And it contaminates meat directly during processing. So we know that 265,000 people are infected with E. coli 015787 h 7 and 100 people die per year. I found this fact sheet from the American Meat Institute. I just got it straight offline. It was available for anybody. And I want to quote what they wrote here. According to data from the U.S. Department of Agriculture, USDA Agriculture Research Service, as many as 100% of lots of cattle, 100%, so they said, may test positive for E. coli 015787h7 when they arrive at packing plants. These incidence rates in cattle vary widely by season and region. Thanks to many food safety technologies used by the meat packing industry, E. coli 015787h7 is removed during processing and is found in ground beef less than one half of 1% of the time. They go on to say, while some recent media reports have claimed that grass-fed cattle have lower incidence rates of E. coli 015787, research shows that the prevalence of E. coli 015787 is not affected by the production system. All right, what does that mean? 
That means that many cows have this in their intestines because this is a fecal bacteria. Humans also have E. coli, but usually not this virulent strain. We have other strains of E. coli, and usually they're not out of control because we have a lot of bacteria in our colon, and they're all kind of competing and living harmoniously, hopefully. But what they're saying is up to 100% of cows, you can find it on their hides, because, right? you know, cows, they poop, and poop gets everywhere, you know? But in, when they test these, the meat, it can be found in there. But what they're saying is, then we process it. I don't know what they do to it, but I know that I have heard reports of using bleach and things like that to remove or kill the E. coli so that in the final samples, when they retest the meat, it's only a small amount. But that small amount, especially if the meat is not thoroughly cooked and not, the bacteria is not killed, can still harm a lot of people. Salmonella. Salmonella leads to 1.3 million infections, 26,000 hospitalizations, and 420 deaths each year. Salmonella can actually also infect plants. I'm going to talk more about that later. But traditionally, when you hear about salmonella, you're talking about eggs because they it contaminates eggs. It's also something that lives on animals and in their digestive systems and on their bodies. Uh, contact with lizards and turtles, even cats and dogs. But what happens is on factory farms, animals have this in their intestines. There's hundreds of thousands of animals together in one place they can get sick together, but also they have to poop. So their poop has to go somewhere. So then they might have these big wastewater tanks and that can contaminate the water system. It can contaminate the soil and a neighboring farm might be growing broccoli or cantaloupe or, you know, the lettuce that you're going to eat in your salad and that E. coli or that salmonella can get on your produce, even if you're not eating meat. So that's why it might be confusing because a lot of the outbreaks that we hear about might actually be on fruits and vegetables. So throw out that romaine lettuce, throw out that spinach, but it, it's not because that bacteria is inherent to that plant. It's usually because it got contaminated. Now there are some bacteria and bacteria that cause outbreaks that aren't coming from factory farming that actually live in the soil. And, but I'm not gonna discuss that today. I'm discussing what comes from animals. The other thing that's important to know is that antibiotic resistance is becoming more common in animals because since they are kept together in these enclosures or there's just a bunch of animals together, even if they're not enclosed in a building, more contact means more disease for the animals. And, you know, if you're just thinking of animals based upon dollars and cents and business, the more animals that die or disease and you can't use, that's less money you're going to make. So in order to preserve your product, you have to give those animals antibiotics, even if they're not sick. It goes into their feed. It just is part of the life cycle of that animal to be given antibiotics. And I've heard a statistic that about 80% of antibiotics that we produce are actually for use in the agricultural industry for their animals. That's a lot. And that leads to antibiotic resistant bacteria because the bacteria are learning, they're getting sm smarter, they evolve. That's what microbes do. I mean, it's just part of evolution. And then that can be passed on to us. One of the examples is MRSA. Methicillin resistant Staph aureus. So this is a bacteria. We have staph that live on our skin all the time, but we can find it in animals too now and all kinds of other things that are probably going to be evolving over time. So that's just something to understand. Then I wanted to talk about climate change. So how, how can climate change be related to any of this stuff? Well, we know that deforestation puts us in closer contact to wild animals because we are displacing them from their homes and then it kind of throws off the balance and then we come into more contact with them. 
one of the leading causes of deforestation is eating animals. The reason is, is because we have to chop down forests in order to grow food for animals. We're growing the food to feed animals, so corn, soy, those kinds of things. We are growing that to feed the animals that are going to be eaten. But also, we are chopping down forests to graze animals. And when we do that, it displaces other animals and they put us in closer contact with wild animals. In addition, climate change, which can be caused by a lot of things, including factory farming, may increase vector-borne infections. Because like I was saying before, it changes weather patterns. There might be more humidity and rain in some places. You may have more growth of mosquitoes um, and other vectors that can transmit these infections. Okay, so that was a, a lot of information. Of course, I talked more than I thought I was going to, but I hope this is helpful. So what are my recommendations and what I hope that you'll take away from from this today is decrease your meat consumption. I understand if you feel that you can't go 100%, that's fine. I've never said it has to be 100%. It doesn't have to be all or nothing, but we need to eat less meat. We need to eat less animal products, meat, dairy, eggs. We need to eat less of those things and stop supporting factory farming because of what I said, all the different problems that come from factory farming, even people that eat meat, Admit that factory farming is probably not the place you want to get your meat from. So we vote with our wallets. So the way to slow this process down is to not purchase it. Okay. Second, definitely don't support the eating of wild, especially endangered animals. Because as we know from several of these pandemics, it's come from trading and eating wild animals, okay? They carry infections, that infection gets passed on to us, then we pass it on to each other. Third, there are some documentaries I recommend. One is called Eating Animals, and another one is called Cowspiracy. So those two documentaries can tell you a lot about how all of this stuff is related. And stay tuned. This month, I'm going to have lots of episodes on climate change and sustainability from different experts, lots of great experts out there that can tell you how you can start doing these things and can help you understand why it's important. So I know that change is hard. Believe me, I know. However, if we don't willingly start to make a change, change is going to be forced upon us. We're already seeing that. We don't want to be home. We don't want to shut down our businesses. We don't want to do that thing, but we have to because of what's going on. This will become more and more common if we don't come together as intelligent, loving, compassionate human beings and find some way that can, we can resolve this in a way that works for most people. Let's come up with a solution because humans are really smart and we're able to solve problems. Remember that we are all connected and we share this planet with so many other creatures, including viruses and bacteria and fungi. So what can we do to tread lightly? What can we do to enjoy this planet, enjoy each other, but also make it a better place? Make it a better place for ourselves, for the animals, for nature, and at the same time, decrease our risk of disease. So it's a win-win-win. We're going to make it better for everybody. So are you willing to make changes so that we can live in a world that's better for everybody? Thank you guys for listening and watching, and I will catch you guys again soon. Have a plantastic day.